Jesus said whilst he was here, this is not my kingdom. Charles Darwin is the truth and the life. Yes. Just one Lord. Because there is loads of false lords. There's loads of false gods. Loads of false gods and loads of false lords. But Jesus is the one true Lord, the one true King, and the one true God. That is what it means. Do you understand? So let me go back to... Uh... Did you just say at the end, Jesus said, this is not my kingdom? Is that what you said? Yes. This world that we have now, this is not his kingdom. Uh, the Roman... What is that? Um, what was the Roman... Uh... How is that not his kingdom? Well, I mean, in accordance to you. Because Jesus is, is the king of heaven. So who is the king of here? Satan. This world oh. is fallen. In the garden, Jesus was the king. And then when Adam and Eve was cast down and out of the garden, and sin entered the world. The world was corrupt. This world needs to be cleansed. So when Jesus comes back for, as the conquering king, when he first came, to the, came through Mary, when he was born, he came as a suffering servant. The only, and you say, well, why didn't he say that he was God? He came to show the way to the Father. He submitted to the Father, even though he could have used his powers. That's why when Jesus went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil tried to tempt him. He said, use your power. You have the power to turn this stone into bread. But he said, no, you shall depend on the Lord your God. He tried to tempt him to use his power. He took him to the top of a high building and said... But did you see how that didn't answer any of the question? Like, I asked him, whose kingdom is it? And then he's trying to explain me the story of what happened on, on the earth between the Father and the King. Coming back to that. So the king of this earth is Satan, you said? Yes. So, so King Charles, he is the king of the United Kingdom. Uh, Putin, he's the king, the prime minister, or whatever he is, the president of Ukraine, uh, Russia. President sorry, of Russia. not Ukraine, Russia. Um, and then you've got like uh, Mohammed bin Salman, he's the leader of this country. And Satan, he's the leader of all of them. But wouldn't you want your Lord to be the leader of the, or the creator of this world and the king of this world? Wouldn't you want your Lord to be the king of that? So, at the end, when he comes back, he came first as a suffering servant. When he comes back for the second time, which is the final time, he will come as the conquering king, how the Jews wanted him to come the first time. They, were, they weren't ready for him. Just like the Jews won't be ready for him again. So, he's going to come as the conquering king. But why does he have to get the conquering attributes later on? Like, if you're the king, right, if you're the Lord, if you're the God, then you'll have that all the time. Yes. That's why he came as a suffering servant. When, um, he came as a suffering servant to take the punishment for sin, and that's, and that's how his body died. He took the punishment for sin. So, certain things have to happen for him to come back. Do you feel like, do you feel like at a certain level, there's some confusion as to his position as the Lord or as someone that came to the earth or is there is there a confusion in your mind between these, right? No, oh, no, it's, uh, it's like the Old Testament, when it, prophes when it prophesies about Jesus, uh, it says that he will come twice and he will have <coughs> two separate missions to do, if you will. 
That's why when he was on the cross he's, and he said it was finished, his first coming was finished. His job the first time wasn't, wasn't to come as the king, it was to come to save those who wanted to be saved. But so, if he's, he's the Lord, right, according to yourself, am I correct? How does, how does he determine how he's going to come and his position to come? And I'll tell you, I'll explain this to you why. It's because as a Muslim, you know this, we believe in Jesus as well, right? In a Jesus, yeah. In, in Jesus as a prophet, just like Muhammad was a prophet, right? And to us, he's a prophet because he's a messenger to come and reveal God's um, word, correct? But you're giving him God-like attributes and saying he chose to come as a messenger, then he chose to be the God and go to the heaven, and now he's going to choose to come back, right? Do you see how that's a bit... It, it, it sort of confuses his position of who he actually is. Like for us, he was a messenger, he came, revealed his message, and he was mortal. That's because the Quran, even though it copied a lot of what was existing at the time, it copied a lot from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, which is part of the Tanakh and the law, and then it copied what scriptures was about at the time from the Christians. It's, it's not necessarily copied, I just want to correct you. In, in this of the Old Testament. I, I, I want to correct one thing. It didn't necessarily copy it. What it is, is if there's a message by God to humanity, it needs to be one anyways. So if there's been message sent to the Christians and then sent to the Muslims and then sent to the Jews, that in its original essence was the same anyways. That's what we believe. Now the difference lies here is where in the Quran has never been changed, right? So as we have it today is how, as it's always been memorized and has always been recited. This is not the case with the Bible and the Torah. If you I mean, watch, prove it to me otherwise. Have you heard of Dr. Uh, J. Smith? Huh? Dr. J. Smith. Now, you, you tell me, in, in, in your own words, I'd like to hear it from you. So, from the research that I've done, sure. uh, the Quran, in its earlier stages, sure. they, it was just the, um, the letters. They didn't have the dots and the vowels above or below the letters. It was just the letters. And then later on, they added the dots and the vowels because they couldn't make any sense of it. Because through further research, if you, turn, if you just get that text without the dots and the vowels, you turn, you try, because um, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, they're all Semitic languages, they're all quite similar, especially Arabic and Aramaic. Sure. Once you put that back into what it was uh, written, um, before Muslims became a nation, in the area where they were, Aramaic was a very dominant language. Obviously, in, in, in Israel, it was Hebrew, and then... <clears throat> Just coming back to the relevant yeah. points, so how has it changed? Yes. So, so or, or give me the references. Like, I'll give you an example. I went to a museum today, right? I went to the British Museum here today. Um, actually, I went there yesterday. I went to another Elizabeth and something. Sorry, it was VNS. Victor, uh, Albert and something. I forget which one. I was walking past that and I went in. And in that museum, I saw a Quran from 700 AD um, that was taken from Cairo. And I read it, right? I read it exactly how it is. And it's, it's a verse that I already knew. So I was able to read it the way it was. And the Prophet passed away in 623. And that's in your museum over here. So I can go and read the Quran and see that, that that verse is exactly the same. So I'm coming back to your point. How was it changed? How has any verse, any ayah, in if we call verse ayah? The world, there are at least 30 different Arabic Qurans. People have come down with Hatun Tash and Dr. J. Smith. They came down with 30 different right. Arabic Qurans. There was the, the Wash and the, what's the, what's the, um, Cairo edition called it, it's the Hass, thank you much. The Hass and the, and the Wash, over 4,000 differences. Hey brother, I'm going to move on from here. Thank you so much. Thank you for your anti-Semitic. I love Israel, thank you.